Read that on. <clears throat> Today, for our Bible study, we're going to look at the book of Romans, uh, the third chapter. And we're going to be talking about uh, salvation. And when we talk about salvation, the, the theological word is as far as God's plan and, and the plan of salvation and uh, the work that Jesus did on the cross. It's, uh, it's called soteriology. It's the study of, of salvation, the study of Christ regaining his people. Excuse and, me, it's uh, called what? Soteriology. It's a theological word for teach about salvation, about theologians. You've got eschatology and soteriology. And uh, macrobionic ology. Got a lot of ologies. <laughs> but you don't know that in seminary. Dictionary. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, uh, our, our, our specific subject this morning is going to be on one aspect of soteriology, one aspect of salvation. And salvation cannot be just presented as. Do you believe in Jesus intellectually and that's all that matters and then you go on about your business? It's a very detailed, complicated subject. Uh, there are many, many different elements within salvation and the work of Christ in bringing about salvation that uh, we, we study and we see in the Bible. He did so many things. Uh, matter of fact, it started before the foundation of the world when God made the plan of salvation. Uh, it was a plan devised by the Godhead. And all three persons of the Godhead agreed on their parts in salvation. And as you study through the scriptures, uh, it tells us in various places what each member of the Godhead's part was in salvation. And really, to simplify it and boil it down, the Father's function was to give the people to be saved to Jesus, the people that he was to die for. And that being his church, another name is the elect, another name is his sheep. Um, and, and, and these are the people that that God gave to Jesus, he tells us about that, especially in John, the book of John. And then the, 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 the part of Jesus agreed upon by the Godhead was that he would be the one to enter history, enter the world, uh, and take on human flesh. And that's a very significant thing. It meant that the, 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 the Father and the Holy Spirit would remain in their spiritual form as they had always been. And so, it, it, and this is Howie's big thing that he, he's always talking about Christology and study of Christ and the importance of, of Christ in this whole realm of things. So we've got to keep in mind that Jesus, the second person, was the, the only one according to these criteria, that could have actually accomplished salvation. Uh, his is the most crucial, most important function in soteriology and in, in, in salvation. Uh, and the question arises, why is that? Well, one reason is that the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit remain in their spiritual form and never up until the time that Jesus came was a Godhead split not divided but, but just voluntarily uh, and purposefully uh, placed into different categories all, all there's never been a beginning with the Godhead they've always been uh, God says in, in the Old Testament that, that uh, 
you know, somebody asked him, what do I call you? And he said, I, call me I am. I am, which means I'm, I just am. I've always been. Uh, and and uh, so for however long it was until history, in the time of history that Jesus came to the earth, the Trinity, I was studying about the Trinity yesterday, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, the Trinity was always invisible to us. Uh, and there wasn't any of us then anyway, so, <laughs> so they were really invisible. They were always in a spiritual form, and um, there was no part of the Trinity for all that beginning of time going backwards that had any human form whatsoever. As a matter of fact, uh, forever into the past, infinite past, which we have trouble even comprehending, there was no human form at all. And there was no earth, there was no universe, there was nothing. Just the Trinity, just the Godhead. And that's one of the miraculous things about God and the thing that we should use in our witnessing because uh, people that we witness to and people that Jeff Rose and those guys that, that uh, preach on the streets and they go to college campuses and they debate people and they preach to people and, and witness to them. And, and, and most intellectuals and a great portion of society across the world today, when you, when you talk about presuppositions is, is what, and this is another word that, that means, let me tell you what it means. Uh, it's hard to witness to somebody and debate them and, uh, and use evidence as a means to win the argument. And that's called evidential uh, apologetics. And what happens, and I learned this all from Cy Tim Bruggenkate, our friend who's a, 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 a presuppositional apologist, and he's been to our church and our conference, and we just really love him. But what he says makes sense to me. He says, and, and, and he got his information from and study from Greg Balsam. And Greg Balsam was a student of Cornelius Van Til. I got his books in my house. Henrietta bought me one a couple of years ago on his theology. But Van Til was a professor at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. And uh, we all know about Philadelphia. City of brotherly love. Mm -hmm where they throw snowballs at Santa Claus. Uh, and I, I was just in Philadelphia two or three weeks ago for, for Jeff's conference up there. And I've got where I kind of like Philadelphia. It's a pretty cool place. It's, it's really big. It's hard to find your way around. But um, Van Til was from uh, the Netherlands. And uh, like Henrietta's descendants, her maiden name is Van Scoy, uh, his is Van Til. And also Cy is uh, Bruggenkate. And, 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 and have any of you ever heard of Corey Tim Boom? Mm -hmm. She was uh, a Christian lady during World War II or World War I in, in the Nazis. Uh, she was fighting against them. How, how, and they, they persecuted her, and she, she kept praying. She was a Christian, and she was a missionary, and, and uh, she was a great woman. Well, the Cory Tin is, is a, kind of a Dutch derivative, and Cy is also one of those cultural uh, anomalies of the, of the Dutch people that, that uh, you know, just, that's just a part of their language. So anyway, uh, Cy study Van Til in Boston. Now, Van Til came up with a new way to, to witness to people and to teach college students and seminary students and to debate with people who were lost and who were the enemies of Christ. And what Sai says is that if you try to prove that God exists and that Jesus is real, 
from scientific or other evidence, then the person, what you do without realizing it is that you actually put Jesus Christ on trial. And this is a little bit hard to grasp, but you put him on trial that we have to prove to the lost person that he's really who he says he is. And Sai says, why would we put Christ on trial and make the sinner the judge? It's a unique way of looking at it. And it had to sink in to me before I really began to grasp it. But, but, but if you take evidence and you, you're, you, what's happening is the guy that you're arguing with or the person um, will say to you, well, prove to me that God is real. Prove to me that Jesus is real, who he says he is. And, and it puts us on the defensive that we have to start proving to them that the almighty God of the universe who controls every single thing is legitimate. And he says that's a very bad way to do apologetics and, and, and to witness. Uh, it puts Jesus on the defensive. And we don't have to prove that he's real. And most Christians, when they use evidence to prove it, can't prove it anyway. Because what happens is, when you, when you get into a discussion or a debate with, with someone who is an unbeliever, especially a very intelligent one, uh, evidence is there for both sides, as far as they're concerned. They think they have evidence. We have evidence. And, and uh, evidence sometimes is very difficult to prove, and sometimes it's easy to prove. But um, That's we why don't you need witness. Yeah, we don't need we don't need to be on the defensive. Uh, and, and, and let them judge us. He says we should just be on the offensive. And that we just should declare to them that Jesus is the Son of God. That God is real. And that's just the way it is. It's a matter of fact. And if you don't believe it, then you've got big problems. You know? And, 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 and to stop being on the defense of what. So what he and Van Til did was they did not try to win the argument through using evidence. Uh, because if you use evidence and, and you make a good point in your argument, there's always going to be somebody that's smarter than you. And there's always going to be the millions of amounts of, element, of, of evidence out there that they can use and, and they can confuse the situation and they can appear they can't really have evidence greater than ours, but they can appear to other people to have evidence stronger than us. And so what Van Ted did is he went back behind the evidence to the presupposition and began to attack that. In other words, every single person, that's, this is important for you guys as we're going to witness, every single person in the world as a presupposition about their worldview and why they believe things. Mm -hmm. He attacked the very root of the problem. And so you go back to a person and you say, well, why do you believe such and such? And they'll say, well, you know, because, because it's written in a book or because somebody said it. Or, uh, and, and, I, and I start with this particular point. And what Van Til did, which we'll get into this in just a minute, he begins with God, and God is a central primary entity that's the beginning and the end of everything. And with knowledge, he says, you begin with God's knowledge. Now people will, will, will argue with you when you witness to them, and they will, they will invariably say that I can, can argue for knowledge, but they always start with man's knowledge on this level. That man's the one that created it with Aristotle and, and uh, uh, Plato and all the early, early, early philosophers. Talks about man's knowledge. The beginning point, the presupposition is beginning with man and his knowledge and like he's supreme. And the one thing that Van Til always stuck to, he said, no, 
you don't ignore the creator and the creature dichotomy. In other words, you begin with God, not man. And if a person begins with man, they're going to stay on this level with man. But if you begin with God and say you've got to talk about God, God is superior to man, and that man can have no knowledge at all unless it's given to him of God about anything. That includes science, that includes mathematics, anything you want to talk about. When you begin with God and say that he's the one that knew all these things and he has allowed us to know a little bit of what he knows, it all comes from God. So the argument shifts from here to become a vertical argument about, about God. And, and when you go from that direction, and that's why this word is so important in the Revelation, because how, how does a man learn anything? A man can only learn anything from the God that knew everything. He was totally omniscient, totally total wisdom, knew everything there was to know. And man has only learned what do you know about anything from God and God's revelation? And God hadn't revealed everything. So he, he still knows a billion times more than we do. But he did reveal to us about himself. And that's why this book is so very important. That through the Bible, God revealed and made a revelation to us. And that's the only way that we will know anything uh, about anything at all, really. And so that's why it's very important that we, we preach and teach this Bible as being the infallible, inerrant Word of God that cannot possibly be wrong in any way whatsoever. And so that's where we should begin, is, is, is with the Word of God. And, 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 the, and the sad thing about a lot of churches uh, in our country and in the world today, and I'm not going to mention the name specifically, but I think you'll realize the ones I'm talking about. The churches that get up on Sunday morning and they open this book and everything they say the preacher says is talking about this book taken from this book. It's preaching the true gospel. It's preaching God and His revelation. Yeah. Now, and, and you know, forgive me if you all are in churches that do what I'm about to say. But I'm just trying to make a very important point here. There's a multitude of churches and TV preachers, particularly churches, who think very little of this revelation in this book. They don't really preach it. It's not, and if they do, they don't preach it much. And it's not their primary source of authority. This has to be your primary source of authority if it's going to be from God. Now, I've been in a lot of these churches. I've had friends who've, who've been in other churches like them who say that they receive direct revelations from God. When they say that, they bypass this book. You can't receive a direct revelation from God because He doesn't give them anymore, not to individuals. He gives them through this book. That's what the book is all about. And so when they say that, you should be very wary and don't listen to the thing they say. And, and, and uh, there are no more prophecies, uh, authoritative prophecies in this world, apart from this book. Because uh, when, when somebody says they're a prophet or a prophetess, uh, that's really not true because... They're bypassing the Word of God, and they're saying that they get their own prophecy. And I, I was telling Helen last week that that the prophecies, the only real prophecies, are in this book. And someone says to you that God has come to them and given them a word of prophecy, and they have spoken it outside of this book. Then that's not from God. It's either from just their ego, or maybe their um, their ignorance in a, in a light sense of the word are, are from Satan. That's a distinct possibility. And uh, so, so you got to have this word as, as the authoritative word of God. That's very crucial. And so uh, keep that in mind uh, today. Uh, in Roman, let's read in Romans and 
that's kind of an introduction to where we're going. Um, and, and I hope that will be helpful to you as, you as you witness to people what we just talked about. But Romans, the third chapter, beginning with verse 25, says, and we're going to talk about this one word a few minutes today. We're going to talk about the word propitiation. And how many of you know what propitiation means? Raise your hand. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> You've learned something from me, me and Howie. <laughs> Tell them in your words what propitiation means. Oh, no. Means. Well, you, if you don't you have know, to. I have no want... words. I only have knowledge. Okay. <laughs> Okay. You've, learned, speaker. you've learned from side 10. It's like I was them. trying to tell him what I was reading in a book. Well, better not you on the thing there. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, you don't have to say it, but you do, you, okay. you do know what we're talking about. But yeah. You, we preached it up so much. I do. Okay, let me, let me explain what propitiation means because it's going to be the word we're going to be preaching about today. Okay, propitiation means that somebody had to be punished for sin. Uh, I, I I was reading yesterday about the Trinity, and some people think that they do a sin, and lightning didn't strike them, and they say, "Oh, I got away with it. God didn't see that one." And and, and then they'll go around and they'll start doing another one, and they don't feel any lightning again, and then they'll just go into a position where they're just sinning continuously. Now, what the Van Til said in that article I was reading is that just because God doesn't punish sin immediately as you commit it does not mean that he will not punish it in the future. He will punish all sin eventually. And so it's a, it's a frightening, scary thing to be in the hands of a holy God, you know. So, so sin has to be punished. That's just a, a natural law of God because God hates sin and He can't tolerate it and He can't be around it. Thank, and I, I say this, I've said this a lot of times. Thank the Lord that God is a holy God and not a wicked God. Now the guys in Syria and Iraq, the ISIS morons. Like it. Uh, pretend to be serving a God and saying that their God causes them to commit murder and mayhem and, and crucifying Christians. And yesterday I saw a film clip where they had little seven, eight, nine year old boys and girls with black things across their face teaching them to murder. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the next generation, that's what Hamas uh, fighting Israel did. They teach them mm -hmm. hatred from birth mm -hmm. and to murder and kill. And they mm -hmm. say that they serve a God. Mm -hmm. They serve Satan. Their God's Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And people need to be preaching that and start preaching. You know? mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, so their sins will be punished as well. Mm -hmm. But propitiation means that if, if a sinner sins all of his life and dies and goes to stand before God, he's going to have a lot of sin that he's sinned and a lot of guilt. And a lot of sin, pent up sin that's got to be paid for. So God will exact his punishment according to the scriptures by putting him in a place of torment forever and ever to pay for his sin. Now, I'm not going to really get into a lot of that right now, but it, it's just a scriptural teaching. I don't, I've never enjoyed teaching about that. It, it's, uh, it's just not a pleasant thing, you know, but it's a reality. Sin's serious, and people need to understand that sin is serious. And um, now there's two, two, two alternatives. The sinner will stand before God, and he will have to pay for his sin. The other alternative is that somebody else will, will pay for his sin for him. And that's what propitiation is. Propitiation is that Jesus came and he died on the cross for his people, the ones the Father gave him, 
and he paid the price for our sins as a substitute. And you know when you substitute in a hockey game or a basketball game or a baseball game, you always have one person going out, one person coming in. And that's how it is with salvation. You know? It's a substitutionary atonement. And, and, and Christ, when he died, his death was real and it was effective and it worked. It did not fail. That's one of the biggest points we're trying to make. It did not fail. So consequently, if he died for every single person in the world and he can't fail, that means every single person in the world would have to be saved because he can't fail. His, his atonement cannot fail. So the Bible teaches that he died for his people, the ones that specific, not just a mass, but specific names of specific people Christ died for. And thank God that, that all of us, I hope and think, are, are, are part of that, that group. Our, our old Spanish preacher says that a group of people, you know. And, 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 and his death is effective. And every, here is a, the most profound statement I think I've ever heard. Well, not the most profound because I made it up. But, uh, but I like it. <laughs> that, I'm sure other people said it too. But here's a statement. For every person who Christ died for, every person for whom Christ died will be saved. That's a true statement. It's a truism. Every person for which Christ died will be saved because he cannot fail. His shedding of his blood and his perfect sinless life had to work. It had to be real. He, he, he died for someone they will have to be saved because he cannot fail. And so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a precious thing that we can keep close to our hearts to give us assurance of our salvation because he cannot fail. And so propitiation means this, that Jesus propitiated for our sins. And what that means is this. God, for the ones that Jesus died for, not everybody, but the ones that for whom Jesus died, God poured out His wrath against their sin and His punishment for their sins on Jesus on the cross. He propitiated. He stood in our place. He died for our sins instead of us having to die for them. And therefore, Andy mentioned grace and mercy in our prayer a while ago. Therefore, everyone for whom Christ died and paid for those sins and took our sins upon himself and suffered, in our, suffered a punishment for us even, every one of us that he did that for will go to heaven to be with him because our sins are forgiven, they're paid for, we're ransomed. He paid a ransom for their sins and, and, and we will be able to be saved. That's the meaning of propitiation. And, and then Romans 3, I wanted to take a little time to explain that word because that word is important. 25 says this, For whom God, Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth, it's going to say what I just said, but it said it first. For whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Whose blood? Jesus. Blood of Jesus. In His blood to declare His righteousness. Now, that's another important word, righteousness. Uh, he's declaring there that, that we had no righteousness. None of us do. We still don't. That's we're saved, really. Mm -hmm. But the righteousness of Christ, His perfect life. You, you realize if He had not lived a perfect life, He couldn't have died for us. It wouldn't have done us any good. Mm -hmm. and, and because He was perfect without sin, He was qualified in God's sight to, to die for our sin. And, and it would be a valid a death of, of, of uh, propitiation for us. And so it's His righteousness that gets us to heaven, not ours. I'm going to sneak out and just go ahead and sneak on that basis. Yes. But it's okay. But it's His righteousness that that we get to heaven on, 
that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now that's another word that's very important this morning. Justified. Uh, justification. And, and it, be, it begins to show you how many things are c caught up in salvation in Christ's death. And this is another aspect of it that we were justified. Uh, the, the word justified is a forensic word. It's a legal word. It's talking about a court system and the le legal word. And because of Christ dying for us, we are just in the sight of God now. He, he, like, it's like we're going to court, we're standing before God, we're like we're in a courtroom, and he says, I'm going to pass judgment on all the sinners, and I'm going to give you a sentence, and the sentence is, is punishment. Mm -hmm. For the Christians that God has died for, Jesus died for, mm -hmm. he will say, you are justified, you're no longer guilty, because Christ justified you when he died for you on the cross. Mm -hmm. So that's, he propitiated for us, he took the wrath of God, he justified us legally, that legally when we stand before God, we will be counted as being not guilty, and, and we're not guilty before God because of what Jesus did on, on the cross. So, that's another important word. Bye, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> and then 27 he says uh, where is thy boasting then is it, it is excluded by what law of works nay but by the law of faith so he says what have you got to boast about because you haven't done anything uh, it's God and Jesus who has, has earned your salvation and then look at, look at Hebrews real quick the second chapter if you will yeah Hebrews 2 Second chapter of Hebrews. I'll give you a minute to, to get there. Ah, you're over there. Okay, now here is another thing he did. Uh, Hebrews 2, 14. Uh, and here's what it says. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And through, through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, and that is the devil. I preached against the, about the devil Sunday. I preached about Satan Sunday. And, and, and here's the, another important part of that salvation plan. This is very important. Remember a while ago at the first begin, I said that God the Father and the Holy Spirit remained in a spiritual form? Mm -hmm. Well, what if Jesus had remained in his spiritual form and came to earth as a spirit as he's always been and he was invisible to us and he couldn't see us? Now, if he never, now listen to this, if he never became flesh and he came to earth in his previous form, Form of being just a spirit, he could not have hung on the cross. It had to be human flesh to hung on the cross. Uh, he could not have really experienced in his body the temptations of, 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 that we all have to d deal with. But because he was human in a body, like us, he was able to really know the temptations and the problems and the fears and anxieties that we go through. And the other important reason, the most important reason is, the reason that he had to take on flesh is because he had to identify with us. And this is just a statement. If he had been dying for the angels, angels are not fleshly. And they don't, they don't have the sin nature of Adam. So it would have been a whole different ballgame. But because we are descendants of Adam, we're sinners the day we're born, and we're in the human flesh, God, I think God saw that we just really could not live a perfect life no matter what we did. Dealt with the Hebrews all that time and, and look at all the mess they constantly made 
And I think that, and I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, this is my own thought, but I, I, I think maybe that God realized that, or He wanted to do what He wants to do, but that we as human beings are not capable of living sinless lives. And that's quite obvious. So one of the answers, and maybe the only answer, and the answer that He came up with, was that He would come and that Jesus become human like us and live the perfect sinless life for us. He knew we couldn't do it. So he let Jesus come and he lived a perfect sinless life and never sinned. And it qualified him to die for us. Uh, the other thing, he, he had, God had to do something about Adam's sin and, and everybody being born in sin. That, that's, that's just always going to happen. So he had to do something to reverse that, to neutralize it, to win a victory over that. And that's what Jesus did with his righteousness. And, and, and then uh, Christ as a human being uh, was a perfect righteous person, fully God, fully man. But the human side of him uh, had to take care of that sin of Adam. And here's what God did for that solution. You know, when a man and a woman are married and they have a baby, the sin of Adam, the Bible te teaches us, is transferred to that baby that's born at birth. You're, you're a sinner. And so, original sin, you know. So, if Mary, Mary, Mary the, the mother of Jesus, had married Joseph and had a baby, it would have been stained with the sin of Adam. And it wouldn't have been any difference. Joseph couldn't have hung on the cross and died for anybody because he's the sinner. It had to be a perfect sacrifice for God to accept. So therefore, are you, do you become blue in the face with anybody that tells you that the virgin birth is not important. The virgin birth is crucial for our faith in Christianity. Because here's what it did. It made sure that Adam's sin would not enter through Jesus being born. He was married and Jesus was conceived of Mary and the Holy Spirit. God bypassed Joseph. He didn't have anything against Joseph, but he knew there was a problem. So he bypassed Joseph. And Jesus was born and birthed into the world through Mary and the Holy Spirit. Now, however that happened, I have no idea. It's a miraculous thing that, 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 that uh, scientists and doctors could never explain. But it had to be that way. Because if Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father, and if Jesus was birthed by the Holy Spirit, he was never contaminated with the sin of Adam. It's very crucially important. Now, if he had been born that way and came into the world perfect, and when he was 29 years old, he committed a sin, he would be neutralized. And he could never die in our place. Because God cannot accept a sinful sacrifice. It has to be a perfect sacrifice. That's why he's called the perfect Lamb of God. But he never sinned. And so therefore, he, he was qualified in God's sight to take on the wrath and the punishment. And uh, propitiation is a very important word. Joe, got any questions or comments? I have several. <laughs> okay. Would you say that how about Mary's original sin? Didn't that pass through Christ? Or was the artificially inseminated? I don't know how the whole thing took place. So could it it's have a supernatural been, I was going to say, could act. it have been like artificially inseminated? And actually, he doesn't have Mary's genes. He was only born of Mary. But actually, it doesn't have Mary's genes because he would have had the original sin. Mm-hmm. So, so it's just a, it's a big mystery. So that's what I would, that, that's my, in order to clear my head up, you know, to yeah, make yeah. some sense, I think always of being this artificially inseminated, 
you know, when you, you know how insemination takes place outside, it's transferred to the woman. So she was like really an incubator, sort of like, you know, right. you know. And so that would explain no original sin for me, the father or mother. Yeah. I see. So I'm not sure. Mary, Mary has no. Can you turn it on? Uh,